Hey there, rulers. Demo73 here, back from Minnesota with a feature match between TJ Green on Little Red Abdul versus Paul Reisman on IU Olympians. Let's go ahead and jump right in. Ruler School is brought to you by Odyssey Games, where you can go to pre-order upcoming Force of Will sets, ccgprimes.com for singles and supplies, cardodoco.com for those rulers in the international market looking for product, the Ruler School Circuit Series now offering our quarter two 2024 circuit kits, and our guest lecturer members, Bite Ramen. Class is in session. So as we get into it here, this little red deck with Abdul is kind of designed to be able to pump stuff up very large uh, and, you know, kind of provide some protection or blanking with Abdul so that our stuff is always bigger than our opponents. Uh, and then, you know, make things just kind of huge and run you over with things like Revenant as well, being able to make every unique guard in the graveyard a plus four, plus four once you flipped little red. And then IU is using the IU extension rule to really hyper accelerate that Olympians package, kind of like we saw at the GP on stream. And this is just Paul's take on it, kind of to see it more played out here. Uh, these guys playing on the wonderful Ruler School Circuit mats. Remember that the Ruler School Circuit for quarter two is available until the end of this week. So you'll want to make sure to get that ordered. Link is in the description. And there are a few proxies for TJ, uh, but we'll kind of talk about what those cards are as they get played with the images on the side of the screen. So going right into it here, with Paul being on the draw, we see a first turn for Seastone. That's going to turn into a, looks like, potentially the addition for Yggdrasil. You do see there's ramp there with terms of, you know, some pretty standard green ramp cards with things like Trishula, but no, Yggdrasil, the tourist destination, is coming down here to help cycle, add our, to our Magic Stone count here. And then we're going to see a pass. And we're going to see a lot of Paul pitching cards every single turn to kind of help re protect the Olympians turn here. Um, choosing to grab Hero Reincarnation and send Fairer Spell to the graveyard is an interesting choice here. But the way the extension rule works is you discard a card, reveal the top two. One goes to the, your hand, the other to the bottom of the deck. So this really can be used during either player's turn to significantly help accelerate the. Um, Union 7 package. There we did see Persephone, but it did get shipped for a flashing smile. We also see a Death Sight the Life Reaper come down here, usually used for in hand to be able to recycle things or be able to protect, kind of continuously buying it back. So it's the thing that we're discarding to the extension rule. But in the case of playing against Grim Rulers that might want to struggle against Imperishable, we uh, or might have Imperishable, we're going to definitely want to put that into play. Going into TJ's turn here, second for Sea Stone. Seeing what's there on the top. It's either a Trishula or a Ma uh, Magic Stone Research Institute. I would think that Trishula would be the better play here, just to actually ramp a full stone. But we do see a Magic Stone Research Institute come down here. I think the Trishula would be better overall because. Um, we don't have any creatures on board as of yet, so the bonus from Magic Stone Research Institute isn't actually helping us, whereas Trishula would allow us to go to four stones on turn three, and it's very unlikely that Paul would probably really try to stop that. Seeing some more pitches there, we do see a Fossil Girl get grabbed, so I imagine that's going to get cast here before recovery to go ahead and pop the... Um, Magic Stone Research Institute, and this is kind of one of the reasons why I thought Trishula might be the better grab. Ayu doesn't, it's all singletons, right? So there's a world where Ayu probably didn't have what was in hand to be able to stop the Trishula trigger, whereas now we'd be at three stones. Uh, now we're still kind of at the same position we were. Our last turn really didn't do much of anything for TJ here as we go into the game. More continual filtering here for Paul. Seeing an Olympian there grabbing Hera. Going into probably just setting the setup to pass. We know there's the flashing smile in hand, so maybe trying to capitalize on what uh, TJ might be trying to do here, especially gets this Abzul gets flipped. Abdul could be very helpful against the Olympians, you know, the ability to blank them, the ability to stop their enter effects under Union 7 is pretty huge. We do see Paramita of the uh, Dead come into play here tapped. This is mainly to help hyper accelerate the Revenant for TJ, as well as being able to play the buyback stuff uh, with the new Worlds arrest, uh, addition. And we are going to see Abdul get judgmented here. Unfortunately, that Abdul is probably not very long for the world. We see the reincarnation Ayu for if we do for a flip. 
Now, TJ goes to try to blank the regalia here. That's not actually something Abdul can do. Ultimately, though, it doesn't super matter because Dispelling Stone's going to come down and pop the uh, tree here just to get that off the board. Although I think probably would want to hit the addition before it can recover just to further set up for preventing what um, TJ is going to try to do here. And then I imagine post recovery, we're probably going to see a flashing smile here. It doesn't really even matter that there's the death scythe because right now Abdul doesn't have his imperishable at all because there's no crimson moon active. Um, so that's not going to really help much here and getting it out of the way just clears up Paul to be able to go in for a nice clean sweep when it's time to go in for the Olympian package that we're slowly building towards. Showing another two. We see Aphrodite come back after the shuffle. We've seen Aphrodite twice. No, that's good luck for Paul for sure. Paul looks like maybe thinking about judgmenting here, but knowing that we have an Abdul on board, there's no reason to go into it right now. It matter it makes sense to just kind of probably throw down the flashing smile, get the Abdul out of the board while TJ doesn't have abilities to respond to it. It's a million cards in hand, so it's definitely going to die. And then we can go ahead and start going into the Olympian package after that. After all, the Little Red herself, probably not going to do much to be able to stop the Olympians once they get rolling. And Paul has been slowly building that Union 7 up pretty quickly uh, to be able to set up for a pretty lethal turn. Abdul not completely useless on his front side, though. The ability to add a Neg 3, Neg 3 is nice. See, we do have a couple Galapas in hand. We see a Trishula. Probably Trisha they're going to come down here next turn, I would imagine, just to try to set up for something. Although it's a matter of, you know, is it enough to be able to give Paul something to be able to play into? See a move to recovery. Call Stone still with Little Red, potentially? Or are we going to start seeing Call Stone with Abdul now that he is uh, Astral? That is the question. Do you see Abdul being used for the judgment here? Gonna go ahead and question what the play is here. So Paul's been pretty, like, you know, hasn't really committed anything to the war, just purely being reactive and setting up the time to be able to mill things. We're gonna send a couple cards to the graveyard here. We see a pointy hat which gets sent there, as well as whatever that other proxy is by Paramita. Looks like TJ's eye in that. Trishula here, which makes a lot of sense to be able to play. One thing to note is, you know, with the stat pumps that can be given by Little Red, that's pretty good actually for Trishula because it's the idea of you can have everything be super huge very quickly thanks to Little Red and then everything has eternal, right? So it's a, even, you know, you really don't need that much to get to 3000 power across your board. And you don't really have to worry about stat nangs after that once that Little Red flips. So getting into that kind of permanent board state here, we do see a Revenant come down here it's currently sitting at a very large stat bump um, but no little red to be able to flip it over it does grab the kind of actual copy from the deck box to be able to represent it this is also serving as a nice spot removal portion so with the number of cards in graveyard now if we can get to a flipped little red next turn. This Revenant is going to absolutely swing in for lethal damage. Um, it's just a question of is Paul playing anything in the main phase that or in the deck that can RFG the graveyard, but also we gotta get through Paramita before we can even do anything with that. So that's something to kind of be aware of. And also the number of stones that uh, TJ has can be banished to stat remove, um, to stat nank things to get them out of the way while also pumping up Revenant. I would not be surprised if next turn we see a little red flip followed by using the stones to spot remove anything that's out of the way and then just swinging in with the Revenant in the air for a ton of damage for lethal and barrier chant is insanely relevant here. Kind of checking exactly the wording here on Revenant. If we do have a way to answer the graveyard, we'd be in pretty good shape. Otherwise, Paul is in for a world of hurt off of this Revenant. We 
Continuing to use the IO ability to fix the hand is very nice. See a hero reincarnation. Looks like this mode is going to be used to buy back a resonator potentially or force the banishing of a resonator and a discard of a card. We're going to attempt to reanimate Magna and Leneth. And then use Ares here. Seems like holding priority to try to get to Union 7 uh, so that we have access to the Magnet and Leneth Union 7 ability. This is a little bit weird in terms of how this chase would be built because Ares does have to target something with an enter effect. So there is a world where this Ares would have to be canceling potentially the uh, hero reincarnation. It's a little bit hard to read here. Um, if Ares can't cancel anything that you, if it's only things that your opponent controls, then obviously none of this matters. Um, but there is a world where trying to do this might backfire just based on how Ares is worded. So Ares gets to come in. We have Magnet and Lenneth gets animated now. Magnet and Lenneth is under Union 7, I believe. So it's going to shoot for a million damage and try to pump up the Magnet and Lenneth. Or pump itself up, I imagine. TJ kind of ex wondering exactly how this is going to work here, letting the Ares enter the field and potentially banishing some stones to kill the Ares before the Magnet and Leneth comes in, just to make the shot of damage from the Magnet and Leneth not as great. Going to choose to banish two stones to uh, knock out the Ares. Here is Reincarnation, gets to enter. Magnet and Leneth now only gets to shoot, still at Union 7, I believe, only gets to shoot for the uh, stats of just the Magnet and Leneth, although it will be pumped up because of the plus one, plus one counters. And we'll be able to give Swiftness and Eternal to itself to be able to swing in that way too. Paul thinking, well, maybe if there's any way to add any additional damage here with something like a quick cast Hera or something, although we are currently under just, I believe, a blue will coin, so that really doesn't do much to be able to add to the pressure here. Potentially one other stone. Getting the seven plus one plus one counters. Getting to be able to swing in dealing some damage because of the ability of uh, the 1300 damage from Magna and Leneth with the plus one plus one counter stat boost. Getting to draw a few extra cards. Choosing not to swing in here, which I think is correct. Um, TJ can just kind of freely block based on how big the, uh, can freely block based on how big the Revenant is and we don't want to undo all that damage that we just took. This does give TJ an interesting opportunity to be able to play into this here. It's just a matter of what Paul is playing in the board or what Paul spot removal has, what removal spot, uh, what spot removal Paul has to be able to get through barrier chant to see if there's a way that maybe we can just flip Little Red here comfortably and then just kind of go in. I'd even consider flipping Little Red, sacking all of the stones to be able to tag, target Magna Leneth and just flooding the board with the pressure here with the graveyard being currently protected thanks to uh, paramita on the undead lord we're in a pretty good spot to be able to keep our graveyard protected milling a couple two more here hitting a dracula and a castle of Reforth, which is really nice potentially because of a if i have a heavenly magic that would be good here it's not going to draw us any extra cards but it is going to be able to add potentially plus 10. we are going to see little red get attempt to flip here was unaware when this Horn of the Sacred Beasts came into play, but I must have missed that getting cast. Which is kind of the perfect response to Revenant here, because it's going to be able to shuffle the graveyard back into the deck, which gets around Paramita of the Undead Lord. Um, or Paramita of the, you know, the, the mill graveyard card. <laughs> Uh, so that, that Revenant's going to drop down to zero attack. In response to the Horned Sack trigger, it does seem like we're going to try to find some way to keep the Abdu uh, Revenant alive. But this does take a lot of the pressure out for TJ. Being able to use a Heavenly Magic here, we can go ahead and 
um, give the Revenant plus five plus five. So it at least will survive the turn. We don't have any copies of Feasting, even though we have some Pure Heart Stones, we're not gonna get to draw any other cards this turn, which is a little unfortunate, but we are going to get to see um, things kind of get shuffled back uh, this way. Um, now, one thing to keep in mind here is that that uh, Heavenly Magic should technically also be in the grave before the Horn Resolution happens. So the way this should work is that at the end of the turn, um, there's no cards in the graveyard so as soon as they go to paul's turn the revenant will be dead because there will be zero cards available in the graveyard this is just a mishandling of how this exact sequence of the chase resolves which is really important again to remember that you gotta move stuff to where it belongs as part of resolution and then resolve the next thing just a good lesson to learn here as we look into paul try to probably finishing out the game next turn So the, re the checking exactly the stat lines here, every card is gonna give Revenant plus four plus four. This Heavenly Magic is gonna give plus five plus five. They're kind of tracking, well, doesn't it become plus 10 plus 10? It's because it gains plus five plus five, and then that's kind of an institutional thing because the plus plus isn't then, then bonused after the Little Red flips. So it's being given a plus five plus five before Little Red comes out. So the plus five plus five won't be replaced to being double that much instead. They're kind of just discussing it a little bit here. So because this heavenly magic is going to the graveyard instead of being shoveled into the deck, they're currently viewing this um, uh, revenant as being statted at plus nine plus nine uh, after the little red resolves. It goes from being plus seven plus seven to plus nine plus nine probably not going to swing in at that point in time it leaves too much to be desired for the um magna and leneth doesn't want to have to block with the uh, little red uh if they can help it um so even the life gain isn't going to be really helpful especially considering just what pressure paul is going to be going to do paul's going to be going into a fully untapped turn at union seven as Ayu. so there's not going to be much that's going to be able to probably help other than keeping this blocker up for revenant so that we have a barrier blocker to be able to play through things still trying to play through here still working through the revenant we do know however that there is a uh, mechanized Shiva or replicant Shiva sitting in the RFG for Paul, which is probably going to almost immediately come down, although TJ will be able to stat neg it out of the board before it can actually hit anything. The enter effect will still resolve, especially if we do solarize it, uh, which means that not a good spot. And TJ would have to essentially be back to square one with number of stones staring down an Ayu deck that's been setting up Union 7 and has all of its will available, which is pretty much just a death sentence for how this match would go. TJ does eventually decide to swing in. Um, seeing how it should only be... Um, plus five plus five uh, because that little red should be back in there that is what we are adjusting the life totals to be on screen it should only be a gain of, of five um instead of the heavenly magic providing the plus four or the card from heavenly magic being in graveyard so that's why you see us have here on screen the 3000 versus 29 it's just a 500 life point swing actually instead of a, a 900 point swing going to go ahead and apply some stat nags to uh, Magnet and Leneth just to further boost it up. Going into Paul's turn after that's all done. So essentially six of the plus one plus one counters have been answered thanks to the Revenant here. So right now the Magnet and Leneth is just hitting for a grand total of 700, but that's still probably enough at least for this turn, we're gonna hard cast the Replicant Shiva. This is gonna then be able to hit the little red because this is damage. Um, it doesn't target, it hits the whole board, including J Rulers when we don't solarize it. Um, 
and so this is going to clear everything and also make the uh, magnet and lens a little bit bigger she's usually thinking about potentially burning some more stones here just to get it off the board although that doesn't really help much in this situation because going that far down on resources would be terrifyingly bad uh, we get two extra counters on both uh shiva and um magna and leneth because of the shiva gil lapis in hand dracula in hand Looks like we are going to see something happen in response to the enter effect, potentially. We're going to go ahead and banish two more stones to get rid of the Magna. Um, the Shiva, it looks like. Oh, no. Getting rid of the Magna Lena just to kill it. In response, we're going to go ahead and flash in Dark Alice to go ahead and get that Magna Lena off the board. Uh, the Death Scythe isn't really needed anymore, so we can banish that. And so the Shiva then gets to finish its resolving its enter effect, and then we get two plus one plus one counters on the Dark Alice, and two plus one plus one counters on the Little Red, and uh, or on the Shiva. And at this point in time, we could probably even just swing into the um, s swing into the little red but really not needed to do that because we can just do keep the faith targeting the hestia this is going to reanimate the hestia hestia is then going to get to burn everything down because we're again right union seven so it gets to hit tj in the face for 500 it gets to then burn the board uh, and tj's face for a thousand uh, and then everything here is going to be able to swing in with swiftness so this is pretty much game um because of the extra damage is 1500 just from the burn effect of Hestia and everything else. And then at this point in time, you have two from Hestia, four total. So that's six from um, the Dark Alice uh, and the Hestia together. And then another nine or another put, oh no, it would put TJ down to one. So it would be 600 damage plus 800 damage from the uh, Dark Alice. I think Paul just misses here that, um, there is the swiftness on everyone because of Union 7, uh, putting TJ down to one with only pure heart stones, I believe. So unable to cast cards uh, would be the way to kind of set this up here. And I think also that's partly because our life totals are different than what is on screen, uh, what they have been tracking because they kind of miscalculated there. Um, but it would have made this cost here, this Gil Lapis completely uncastable because TJ would have had to pay 100 life and would not have been able to actually make that play happen. We do see a Gil Lapis vampire come down here to try to grab a uh, the Revenant back, but fully tapped out, so can't really do much beyond that. TJ can save some face by using Abdul to stat neg, uh, but ultimately it's not gonna be enough here to really get the job done. Especially with Paul being able to just fully have a free turn to go in here uh, against the Little Red Abdul uh, before it has the chance to play the Revenant down again. And it's so low on life um, that it's not going to be able to put much up a fight. Paul chooses to swing into the Gil Lapis with the Shiva. It's going to kill it, make everything a little bit bigger. So this is again, uh, six damage from the little red. It's gonna be four damage from the Hestia, which would be lethal. So again, if we had just swung in last turn with everything, that would have been the game. Um, we're gonna apply a, a minus three to the Dark Alice. It wouldn't have mattered. We're gonna flip the IU with judgment. We're gonna reincarnate it. The reincarnation doesn't really matter other than just to serve to put a body on board. This is gonna have swiftness. So it could just swing thanks to Hestia, um, searching for a soul, which is Dark Alice, or the Zeus Alice, which we could pitch if we wanted to. And then ultimately just for some flashiness here, we're gonna go ahead and do God Art and call Electra. And we're just gonna go in and play that to just lock out the game on a fully tapped out board and say, look, the game is over. There really was no need to do this, but I respect it. And we get to see the rest of Paul's beautiful deck as it tries to find the uh, where the Electra is hidden. So we're just going to keep digging. We do see there's some interesting souls. Finally get to the Electra, hard slam the Electra, and finish off the game that way, taking us to a game two for the IU Olympians build.
Going into game two here, TJ choosing uh, to go second, jumping right into a call zone pass from Paul and into turn two from, or turn one from TJ. Once again, we're gonna be pitching pretty much every turn for IU here. Seeing a Wish of the Fallen Kingdom and then Essence of Athenia's power, which is really good in the case of being able to set stuff up for the graveyard. We're gonna see a coin out Paramita of the Dead, making that Essence of Athenia's power a little bit less good, um, but we can still kind of keep going from there. Down comes the Apollon here, just to go ahead and pop the uh, Paramita, which is a really great setup for Paul. Burned the Will Coin off of TJ, now is up on Will for the rest of the game, and has the ability to kind of mess with the graveyard as needed if that Revenant does come down. Also, Apollon RFGs it from the graveyard, so Revenant doesn't even get the added benefit of being under that card, uh, and it just kind of sets things up for um, not going well. Down comes uh, Yggdrasil. It's going to get to draw a card and then a pass. We're going to see more pitch for the uh, effect here. Pitching what looks like another Olympian. We see a girl staring at and an Oborozuki. Oborozuki is probably going to come down next turn and help even further accelerate the Union 7 count, which if we can get... Oh, and there's a Zeus Alice. If we can get to Union 7 quickly enough uh, under this um, Apollon, everyone's going to be large and have... Um, a lot of ability to just play through whatever TJ might be able to play through there. Down comes the Oberazuki. It's going to hit another card to hand Graveyard and RFG, and we've already been sending a lot of cards to Graveyard every turn, so Obo itself is already going to be big. A little bit of a missed opportunity here with the Abdul. The beauty of Abdul is that it kind of always answers Obos, so while they're still 2 twos, you just always tap and get them killed um, beforehand. Um, and I think at this point we actually were already at Union 7, so Paul just choosing to swing in with the Apollon. Um, everyone is bigger, uh, gonna apply a slight stat nag just so it doesn't get absolutely destroyed, but it's still gonna swing in for 16 damage. Um, or it has barrier, so it wouldn't actually even be able to stat neg the Apollon, so it is going to be the full 16 damage there. So a little bit of a missed opportunity to just get rid of the Oberozuki before we get out pressured, because right now we're already being threatened with lethal, and we have not had any time at all to be able to try to set up. Like, this is two things that are just going to be able to hit like a truck. Uh, Paul's going to be able to set up for whatever play they want next turn, including if there are bodies, we can just go into a hard cast replica Shiva and clear the board. So a little bit of an unfortunate situation of a slower deck finding against the um, deck that built Union 7 by turn 3 thanks to the power of the IU extension rule uh, and that really just goes to show exactly how strong that extension rule can be it's like oh you wanted to play Zeus this is Zeus at home and it's still just as fast as Zeus you just have to deal with the fact that you're going to be burning through cards at your hand but the card selection in a singleton deck it's insanely good um so you can really build a pretty competent engine here to just kind of get through and play to the end game of the union seven and if it's not a good olympian for you at the time you just discard it to go digging for more stuff looking at the board state here tj trying to see if there's anything that they can do to try to establish or we'll play through here a board wipe would be great um but doesn't super help too much if we can't get in the pressure to clear what's on board or put up enough blockers and then even then we're staring down replicant shiva we'd have to be having something that's eternal there would be something to be said about playing um their own replicant shiva at this point but that still doesn't answer the apollon which is the problem because it has barrier and eternal so there's no way that's going to get killed Ultimately, looks like we might just be seeing a pass, unfortunately. Did just decide to pay 300 light to the Killing Stone just to be able to have an extra bit of will here, but I'm not really sure how much it helps. Does just decide to pass the turn. So at this point in time, it's just Call Stone, and I think you go straight into combat as Paul. There's really no reason to do anything else. 
We're going to swing in for the attempted 16. We're going to apply a stat knight to the Oborozuki. It doesn't really matter. Uh, and then just the Oborozuki can swing in for a lethal here just to see if there's anything there. They both fly. They're both huge because of the plus 10, plus 10 from Apollon. And just like that, we close out the game. So thank you all so much for watching. We'll have the IU list up later this week. Let me know what you thought in the comment section down below. And until next time, this is TMO73 saying class dismissed.